Happy, happy Friday, everybody. Welcome back. Once again, you're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. Today, we're going to zoom to my hometown, Nashville, Tennessee. That's right. You heard it right. Been in New York for over 20 years, but I'm a Nashville boy at heart. Before I bring my guest on today, though, the message of the week, uh, it is something I heard many times in my martial arts journey has to do with the positive mindset and the fact that the positive mindset can be worked. It is much like a muscle with repetition and with practice, it gets stronger. Today, we're going to talk about how to strengthen that positive mindset. With that, I'd like to welcome to the show author Chris Kelso. He's uh, also an executive coach, and he recently re released a book, Overcoming the Imposter, Silence Your Inner Critic and Lead with Confidence, Dealing with the Imposter Syndrome, a word I was first introduced to maybe only like 14 months ago, uh, and it's kind of, it's become a, a real hot a real hot topic lately. Uh, so with that, welcome, Chris Kelso. How are you today, sir? Hey, Jeremiah. I'm doing great, man. How are you? Good. So before we, we dive into your book, um, as, as we've done uh, in the clubhouse room and, and also on the B2B hour, can you give a little background for any listeners uh, that might not know what the imposter syndrome is, who were maybe where I was uh, about a year ago? Sure. Yeah. Imposter syndrome it's a, it's a psychological term that was coined in the 1970s, and it refers to the tendency of many people, it turns out, to, to really overvalue the accomplishments and success of others and to undervalue or even doubt the reality of their own success. And what, what happens when you have imposter syndrome is you you look at other people and, and you say, boy, you know, Jeremy is successful because he's really smart and savvy and he's knows how to make all the right moves. And he really seems to have it together and he's got a plan and he's executing well. And whereas my success on the other hand has involved a lot of luck and timing and, and just happening to know the right people or be in the right place. And man, there's a million mistakes that I made along the way that could have really sunk me, but I just managed to figure out my way through it. And um, and the underlying fear is that maybe I'm not really what everyone thinks, seems to think that I am. Maybe I don't quite measure up. And at some point, I, I'm worried that someone's going to figure that out. <laughs> and, and eventually, you know, someone like Jeremiah is going to say, hang on, Chris, you don't, you don't really know what you're doing. You're just making this up as you go. You don't belong here. And and at that point, you know, I'm going to be exposed as a fraud and, and kicked out of the entrepreneurial community or whatever organization or community you might be a part of. So this is a, it's a fairly pervasive uh, thought pattern. It's a, it's a pattern of thinking that uh, some studies show up to 70% of the population experiences this at some point in their career. So it's, it's a lot more common than, than people think. And, and it applies to anybody, right? Not just entrepreneurs and business owners. This is something Absolutely. that any, anybody can be affected uh, by. But as you pointed out uh, in the panel discussion on Ryan's show, that it, it does seem to uh, happen more often for, for high achievers, who, for people who are going. It's, it's kind of like you just have a, a higher batting average because you're, you're going for it more, right? <laughs> Yeah, statistically, it is, it's more prevalent among high achievers. And I think that's in part because people who are pushing the boundaries, who are stretching themselves, who are trying new things, who are experimenting, they're more likely and more often uh, going to find themselves in a place of being out of their comfort zone, being in over their head, being uh, you know, maybe beyond their education, their knowledge, their experience. I mean, that's sort of what we do as entrepreneurs, right? We, we experiment and we try things and we sometimes are doing things not only that we've never done, but that no one's ever done. We're, we're trying things out for the first time and seeing what works. And, and those kind of people also experience a lot of failure on the way to success, right? When you experiment, when you try things out, um, you're going to have things fail. And, and those failures sometimes are more frequent uh, than the successes. You get you go through a lot of failures, a lot of trial and error to get to that win. And so over time, sometimes the the failure mindset can begin to pervade. And you think, man, if I was really legit, I wouldn't I wouldn't be failing quite so often. I would get it right on the first time. And the truth is, you know, Jeremiah, that 
none of us, we, we rarely get it right on the first try of anything that we do, right? We, it, it's, it's a series of experimentations and trial and failure and learning along the way. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, you know, one, another thing that we hear often in martial arts is like, be your best cheerleader, like be your own best cheerleader. Don't, yeah. don't look for it externally. Like that external validation can really let you down because people are, people are funny, right? Yes. <laughs> so it, yes. It, it's really important to be, um, to be your own advocate. And, and like I was saying at the beginning of the show with the opening message that gets stronger with repetition. It's again, that like kind of batting average, uh, uh, analogy, yeah. like the more you do it, the, you know, potentially the better you can, the more, you know, the better you can be and the stronger you can be, but also at that same time that like you're saying there's the, that potential for failure. And yeah, to me, it seems like, I know for me, like most of the failures have not been catastrophic. It wasn't like the loss of a business most of, yes. most of the time. That's definitely right. Happened. But right. when you were saying right. that, I was just thinking about the process and how when the, the term was first introduced to me, it was on the show, actually, it was live. And, and it was it was a business coach. And she was like talking about imposter syndrome. And I was like, what's that? And she explained it quickly. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I don't have that. Like, there's no breach in my confidence, you know, because I just go for it. To yeah. me, I feel like it yeah. shows up more in like these small daily battles where you constantly are telling yourself, like, I don't know, I don't know if I'm worthy. Like you're already committed. Yeah. You already have like, you've already made the big step and opened a business or, or taken a big leap. Uh, maybe you have like a high position in a corporation or something like that. You're already there, but it's yeah. like, would you agree that it's more so like that those kind of small daily battles where you you're more afraid of the failure than like necessarily the big steps you probably already taken? Yeah, I think it, you know, if you were afraid of failure on a massive scale on the really big things, then you wouldn't attempt anything where there was risk involved, right? right? And so you're right that a lot of entrepreneurs um, may not on at first blush think that they've ever experienced that or more likely people that look at and admire entrepreneurs and business owners and leaders would think, well, they they they're very confident. They haven't ever experienced this one. And the answer is well that that confidence comes from experience. And as a, a good friend of mine often says, experience is what you get when you expected something else. So those nice. experiences and that confidence is built a lot of times on failures and, and mistakes. And, and also, you know, to your point of the, the little things are often where we're, we're making, doing a lot of that experimentation. Right. And and we're, we're, we're kind of doing micro experiments on a daily basis. And it's the areas that we get outside of our comfort zone where we're more likely to experience imposter syndrome. If you're doing something that you've done over and over for the last 15 years, uh, you probably feel pretty confident, I got this. But that again goes back to why it's more prevalent among high achievers because your average run of the mill person is completely satisfied with doing the same thing day in and day out for 15 or 20 or 25 years, right? Just punch a clock, collect my paycheck, go home, try to enjoy my life. And, and those people aren't going to experience imposter syndrome because they're not stretching themselves. They're not trying anything new. Um, but those of us that are just never quite satisfied and not in a discontent or frustrated way, but with, hey, there's always more. There's always another opportunity. I can learn something new. I can try something. I can gain a new experience well, that kind of attitude just means you're going to frequently run into that feeling of, oh boy, I got a little bit over my skis here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm outside my wheelhouse and I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm just muddling my way through it. So it's, it's quite different than just like full on self-doubt. Like you, yeah. you, you distinguished earlier, like those people are people that are just not taking the chances anyways, like kind of almost paralyzed by fear. This is not that, this is not in no way compared to that. This is not that it's, it's maybe a micro version of that or a, a, a limited version of that. And in fact, um, you know, a lot of psychologists, actual like clinical psychologists and psychiatrists do not like the term imposter syndrome right. because it's not truly a syndrome, right? Syndrome has a clinical meaning and it's a syndrome sort of connotates a, a something that's broken that needs to be fixed. And Imposter syndrome is not something wrong with you. It's not, it's not something that is broken that needs medical treatment. Um, 
it is a pattern of thinking that can be very unhealthy if you allow it to dominate you. And in particular, if you allow it to hold you back, if you are unwilling to take risks because you feel like anytime you uh, don't, aren't completely confident, then the risk of failure is high and, and that's going to hurt you, then you're going to shirk, you're going to pull back, you're going to resist uh, taking those risks. So it's not a syndrome in the clinical sense. Um, so some people call it the imposter experience or the imposter phenomenon, but it's, again, it's that pattern of thinking that when allowed to control and dominate your thinking can become very unhealthy and can really hold you back in a lot of ways. But in small doses, I've actually learned to see it as a sign of potentially good things happening, yeah. right? That it, it does mean I'm pushing the boundaries. It does mean that I'm trying something new and there's a great learning opportunity here. I'm not sure if it, it was mentioned on Brian's show or not. I remember saying this on some show, but there was like a study of people that uh, people in that, that considered themselves under like high anxiety and strain and people that were uh, experiencing like excitement and the, the physiological response was the same. Yes. For both people, <laughs> you it know, is. what was happening, like the sweaty palms and all that. It's like, one half of them were excited. They were like, yeah, let's do this. You know, all the, all the telltale signs, higher blood pressure or whatever, you know, same yeah. with the people that were kind of freaking out though. Yes. I actually, I wrote an article in fast company a couple of months ago that talked about how, when you have, when you feel anxiety, when you're stressed, when you're nervous, when you're anxious, the, the sort of prevailing wisdom or the advice that people often get is to just try to calm down, right? To, to take a deep breath and settle your nerves. And the reality is that doesn't work very well because when your body is already in that heightened state, when, you're, when your adrenaline is flowing, suppressing that energy can sometimes backfire. It can actually work against you. But to, to your point that you just made and based on some of those studies, anxiety and excitement are very similar emotions. Physically, they're almost the same. It's just that anxiety is the anticipation of a negative outcome. You're worried something bad's going to happen. Excitement is the anticipation of a good outcome. You're expecting something positive. And so by just reframing the situation and, and taking your mind off what could go wrong and thinking about the possibilities that are there and even some just positive self-talk as simple as that is to tell yourself, I'm not nervous, I'm excited. The emotion is almost the same. The feeling and the physical, uh, you know, what's going on in your body is almost the same. It's just a mental shift from I'm expecting something bad to happen to I'm expecting something great to happen. And all of a sudden you're not nervous, you're excited. And it's a big difference. Totally agree. I've experienced it many times. It's great. Well, I am excited for our first break and our second segment. So we're going to take that right yes. now. Everybody keep the excitement. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back, everybody. If you're just tuning in, again, this is The Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. Today, we're Zooming to Nashville, Tennessee, talking to author Chris Kelso. He's also an executive coach and a keynote speaker, and he recently wrote and released the book, Overcoming the Imposter. What's I can't, you're, you're truncated now. I can't remember the tagline. What is it again, Chris? Uh, Silence your inner critic and lead with confidence. Did I get it right? Are you there, Chris? Hey, Jeremiah, I'm sorry. I'm having a headphone issue. Oh, okay. Real quick. Let me see if I can get this fixed. They just quit on me and I can't hear you. So I know you're asking me a question and <laughs> I apologize. I can't hear. Let's see if this works. Can you hear me? Not yet. Do, 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 do. Nothing like, there we go. Nothing like being on Got live it. radio and... Uh, Having a equipment failure happens all the time, man. Something I'm like yeah. so used to it now. Especially, you know, we were we were live in studio. My guest was always like right across the table from me prior to COVID, and then everything went to to Zoom. And like those first, I don't know. I think in the first three months, like every other show, there was a major crash. Yeah, you know, guys get frozen. Audio wasn't yeah. working. You just get used to it. Doesn't bother me. Yeah, I made the mistake during the break of picking up my phone, and as much as I love Apple products, my AirPods switched to my phone, and they would not switch back no matter what I did. So, gotcha. I there. Yeah, I I studied music, and uh, I I did a lot of audio stuff. I'm 
I'm, I'm very into things being hardwired. <laughs> yes. Just like actually connected. A, it makes, it makes the difference, especially in this kind good, of situation. Good case for that. I'll, uh, I'll use some wired headphones next time around. Yeah. Um, I, I, when I was, I was introducing your book and your, your picture was small and I'd forgotten the tagline, but then I remembered it. Um, so I nailed it. So yeah. that's what I, was, I was saying, I, I got it right. And I was like, correct. And you just looked at me and I was like, Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, he's asking me something. I know it. <laughs> right, right. I thought yes. you were looking at me in total disgust. Just like, no, you butchered it. You I'm blew not it. To you totally to blew you. it. I'm not talking anymore. <laughs> No, I'm sure you nailed it. Silence your inner critic and lead and, with confidence. That's that's really the goal is to to regain the confidence, to reframe that inner voice and to 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 change that from a negative to a positive. And you can actually, as we mentioned just before the break, you know, I've learned to start seeing imposter syndrome and to to see that that feeling of I may be in over my head here as an actual positive sign. Oh, there's a learning opportunity. Oh, there's, you know, I'm, I'm among people who intimidate me. That means there's a lot I could gain from this audience, from this group, from, from, from being here. I don't need to, you know, to pull back in fear. I need to lean into this situation. And so um, the confidence comes from knowing what's possible and knowing that even that inner critic, that voice of doubt is actually a signal that good things are happening. I like that. My, one of my mentors always says a problem is an opportunity. Like, yeah, you're faced with this thing and you're like, uh, yeah. but uh, there, there are a lot of good things that can come out of it. Another, another one that uh, our old, uh, like our, our sensei, the, they call him professor in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu used to say was yeah. um, the conversation you want to have the least is probably the one you want, you need to have the most. Yes. You know? <laughs> like you're true. like, man, I don't want to do is it. So it's going to be, gonna be so uncomfortable, but but like you do it and yeah. you grow. Yeah. You always yeah. grow. And I've seen that in business as well. The, the thing that I am avoiding, the thing that I'm procrastinating <sighs> is probably the most critical thing yeah. that I need to focus on today, right? Whether it's, whether it's finally sending that proposal or answering that client or, you know, addressing that issue that's going on, whatever the, whatever the thing is. Um, and, and I've learned to sort of remind myself of the good feeling I get when I finally put that thing to bed, you know, when Absolutely. I finally do the thing that I've been putting off and I get on the other side of it and go, Oh, that's so great. It's done now. I don't have to worry about that. I remind myself how good that feels and use yeah. that, try to use that as motivation to push through it when I want to procrastinate. And you check and you still got all your fingers and toes and you're like, that's oh, right. It wasn't so bad, but yeah, it's, you, you totally talk yourself to the ledge in those situations. You know, yeah. it's crazy how you yeah. play out in your own head. Like, well, what if they do this? Then I have to respond like, you have no idea. Yes. It might not right. even care. It might not even be a thing. And you get yourself all worked up. It, yeah. it rarely goes the way you imagined it in your yeah. head, right? Yeah. With all those negative possibilities. Yeah. One of the thing when I was, uh, when I was developing this book last year, I spent a lot of time really digging through my career up to this point, going back and revisiting you know, times that I struggled or felt insecure or, or, um, or was uh, in over my head in some way. And I, I recognized this really incredible pattern. And that was that the times I felt the most insecure, the times I felt the most like an imposter, those were the most pivotal moments of my career. Those were the times when something really, really great was happening. I just couldn't see it at the time. But again, I was either with people that intimidated me or I was trying something new for the first time. And, and even when those trials failed, I learned something great that propelled me to the next big victory. And so there again, I've, I've really learned and, and, and it wasn't, it was in the process of actually writing the book that I sort of learned this and had this realization of, man, that sign that feeling of feeling like an imposter is a sign that something really awesome is happening and so i actually get a little bit excited now when i feel in over my head i get a little yeah. bit of anticipation you know i do turn that nervousness into excitement for what's possible that's like uh the like old fighters they would they would say that the fear helped them like if you went into yeah. a, a, a like a prize fighter if you weren't afraid going in you were probably going to get knocked out <laughs> right you know? right you, you yeah, really the people need... who say you should have no fear, that's, I mean, that's just foolish. 
Yeah. First of all, it's not possible. We're right. humans. We experience fear. It's a, it's a part of it. But you know, the 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 really courageous people are the ones who move ahead in spite of the fear, not the ones that have no fear. That's not courageous. That's crazy. <laughs> courage and crazy are two different things, right? And courage <laughs> means you have the fear, but you move forward anyway. Um, and speaking of you know, being it maybe potentially in over your head. I mean, what was the impetus for the book? Did you did you study writing in, in college or was there a no. point where you're like, I'm going to write a book, but I'm not a writer. And and how did that feel? Absolutely, there was. <laughs> um, in fact, I've been told for years that I should write a book, uh, you know, about some experience, some part of my life and career and things like that. And I've always just sort of said, man, I'm not a writer. I don't enjoy writing in particular um, I've written some articles and short form things over the years, but, um, but never written anything this big. And the, the book came about because I actually, because I wrote an article a couple of years ago um, on Quora, uh, the, the question and answer website, Quora, yeah. mm -hmm. someone posted, what do entrepreneurs struggle with most? And I had just recently been studying imposter syndrome a little bit and learning a little bit about it and, and had started to see it in some of my coaching clients and the other entrepreneurs I was working with. And so I just sort of wrote this, uh, you know, two page article about, well, here's something that I think is very prevalent, but isn't talked about very much. And I explained, I laid out a couple of reasons why I think entrepreneurs in particular are susceptible to imposter syndrome. And we've talked about some of those reasons already that you're pushing the boundaries and you're trying new things. Well, the article went crazy. It got, it's been viewed somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 times and nothing I had ever written to that point has had that kind of traction and exposure. So I knew I had struck a nerve there and hit on something interesting. And I started talking about it at, um, at a couple of conferences and I would be invited to speak at an event and, and I would either incorporate imposter syndrome into a talk or actually begin to give just talks on imposter syndrome itself. And the response that I would get from people was incredible. I would, I would literally finish a speech and have someone come up to me and say, you changed my life today. Like I had no idea. I thought I was the only one just hearing that, you know, this is a common thing. It would just really opened my eyes and thank you so much. And, and again, these are successful entrepreneurs. These are yeah. not, you know, they're not just your run of the mill average Joe working a job. These are people that own their own businesses that are doing things, but have struggled silently because they didn't know, they didn't have a name for it. And they didn't know that it was common. They thought it was just them. And so over time, I just, um, it, it became a compulsion. I decided that a book had to be written and I searched for a good book on this topic. And I'm not saying there aren't any other good books on the topic. I couldn't find one that really spoke to me as an entrepreneur and to my tribe, which is mostly business owners and entrepreneurs. And um, so I couldn't find a book that I would recommend to people. So I said, well, if it doesn't exist, I've got to write it. And, and that began, began the process. So it was about a three-year journey um, from that article that I wrote to beginning to speak about it, to making the decision uh, a little over a year ago to write a book and then going through the process of developing it. So this was a kind of like a pandemic project then. It was. It, it, it's interesting because I signed the contract with my publisher in March of last year. So I made the decision to, before the pandemic. It wasn't you know, some brilliant, I'm going to take advantage of the time yeah. uh, while I'm at home. But it literally, I met with my publisher. It was one of the last in-person meetings I had last year. And we were going into lockdown and just starting to get a sense for how serious this was going to be. And I already had a plan to write a book and it, it, it worked out really, really well. In fact, in hindsight, now knowing how much work is involved with writing a book, <laughs> Um, I don't know that I would have gotten it done on time because yeah. we set a pretty aggressive timeline. And uh, had I had a completely full plate last year, it would have been tough to do, but it worked out. It worked out really well. That's really awesome. I, I had the most productive year of my history in 2020. Yeah. Um, and, and again, that wasn't, I'm not going to claim brilliance. It just sort of the, the timing of some things that I put on the calendar and said, I'm going to do this this year. And then the the, the slowdown that limited travel and things like that, it really, it worked in my favor in some ways. That's awesome. Really cool. 
All right, we're going to take another break. Everybody hang tight. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, welcome back. Again, we're talking to Chris Kelso today. He's an executive coach, keynote speaker, and the author of the recently released book, Overcoming the Imposter, Silence Your Inner Critic and Lead with Confidence. We talked about, you know, what imposter syndrome is, you know, kind of how the book uh, begat and, and uh, how the pandemic offered an opportunity to really lock it in and get it done. Because yes. otherwise, I hear they're not easy to do. I would love to write a book one day, but I'm like, I don't, man, I don't know. I don't know about it's that. It's a lot but, of work, but it's totally worth it. Absolutely yeah, worth it. I'm sure it is. We'll, we'll get there. We, I might need another pandemic to get that done. Yes. <laughs> I don't want that, though. I don't need no. that. We made it no, 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 no. We're not asking for that. No, we're not. Um, a couple other questions I have for you. Um, when were you first introduced to this idea of the imposter syndrome? You, you've dated it back like kind of it was coined in the 70s. When did you yeah. first hear of it? And how did you end up in Nashville? <laughs> Boy, the, well, those are two very different <laughs> yeah. questions. Um, the, the, you know, imposter syndrome is not something that I knew a lot about, or I, I'm not even sure when I first heard of it. It may not have been more than a few years back. I mean, okay. as I said, when I wrote that core article, it was something I was really just in the midst of researching and learning about. Um, but the moment I heard it, and I think the first time I remember hearing it, it was also from an executive coach who, uh, who mentioned it in telling a story. Um, and it really resonated with me. As soon as I looked it up and started to read about it, I said, oh man, that's totally what I've experienced at, at times in my career. You know, I've felt completely in over my head and, and just making it up as I go. And, and, uh, and, and definitely felt like um, many times that other entrepreneurs seemed to, seemed to know what they were doing and even maybe were just being nice to me. You know, I felt kind of like the, <laughs> the, the little kid that gets to go out on the football field and they hand him the football and let him run for a touchdown and they pretend like they can't tackle him. And I, at times I thought other entrepreneurs were just being nice to me that way, like treating me like the, oh, look at Chris, he's trying to do this too. Yeah, we'll throw him a bone here or there. Um, but it was just a mind game. I mean, it was just my, my own self-doubt, that, own, that inner critic trying to, yeah. trying to mess with me. I know that so feeling. It really... It really resonated when I when I learned about it. Uh, your other question was, you know, how did I get to Nashville? I I grew up in Central Florida, um, a little city called Lakeland, which is between Tampa and Orlando, down right in the middle of the state, and still have some family down there. Um, but I moved to to Nashville in 1994, right out of high school, uh, and believe it or not, it was because of the music industry. Um, I am not a musician per se, but I used to be very involved in the technology side of music, sound and lighting and yeah. studio recording. Uh, I was actually on the radio in, in Lakeland. I had a radio show and did a lot of production work for a radio station down there and did some live concerts and stuff like that and wanted to get into record production and things like that in Nashville. Um, once I got to Nashville, I toured with a band for a few years and then I met my beautiful wife and got married and decided that life on the road was not a good, a good match for a healthy marriage. So I got off the road and sort of backed into a career in technology. Um, and so I haven't done anything with music in a long, long time, but it's what got me here. And I'm so, so thankful because I just absolutely love Nashville and Middle Tennessee as an area. That's great. You got there. We left in the late 80s. Okay. We moved, we moved out in the late eighties and uh, yeah, it was kind of rough back then. Mm, it was like, yes. well, it was little, downtown was a different place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a yeah. little speedy. It was, it was not what it is today. <laughs> it's funny because I came, I, I, once we left, I think I visited one time as a, as when I was like 16, you know, probably around the uh -huh. time, at, yeah. at like the early nineties uh, as, as a teen. And we didn't really stay in the city much. The grand old Opry had moved outside of the, the city at that point, right. and we stayed yep. out there. My mom, my mom studied music in Nashville. Um, okay. they, that's how I was born there. Then my parents went to college there, and um, so I did, I went back in like two thousand. It was either two thousand two or two thousand three for for a music uh, mm. conference, and um, it was downtown, you know, yeah. convention center and everything. And I'm on the phone and with my dad. Totally, yeah, different totally place. different. <laughs> Telling yes. my dad where I was at, and he's like, "Man, we wouldn't have been caught dead there." And he, like, he and his buddies, they were tough, you know, they were tough guys. And he was like, "Nope, when we live there, yeah. we'd never be down there." So it's, I was curious if it was like you ended up there because it now it's kind of like this this 
there's a it's a hub for entrepreneurship now. There's so many crazy businesses. Yeah. People are just yeah. trying everything there. So I was I was curious how uh, how that works. Yeah, it wasn't entrepreneurship uh, or the tech scene that brought me here. It was it was music, and I was here kind of back in the day when it was still downtown was a little bit uh, was a little bit sketchy. Yeah, yeah, no. But man, it's been awesome to see the transformation that yeah. has happened. And, uh, and you're right. There's a thriving entrepreneurial scene. Um, I'm a, an advisor at the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. Uh, so I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and, and early stage companies down there uh, and teach some of their classes and, and, and things like that. And it's just been great to see that scene come up and thrive. Because even when I started my first business in uh, 2007, that ecosystem just did not exist. And I had to just you know, I had to just go figure it out on my own and, and make my way. Uh, I remember going to uh, a bookstore and buying a stack of books on whatever I thought I needed to know to run a business, finances and sales and marketing and contracts and all this. And I just, I had to self-educate. So um, I'm really appreciative now for all the programs and, and tools that exist for entrepreneurs who are just, you know, getting started and figuring it out. Yeah, my friends and I talk about that often how, you know, back in the day, it really wasn't to talk about a term that wasn't tossed around much, right? Like entrepreneur really wasn't, yeah, wasn't a buzzword. We, you know, you were just a business owner, but some of us thought a little differently. (laughs) Maybe that's what it was, right? you know? Yeah, it didn't have quite the cachet that it has today. And it wasn't, uh, today it's almost trendy. Like everybody wants to call themselves an entrepreneur in some way. And, uh, but you know, some of us were doing it before it was, it was that hot. The first time somebody called me an entrepreneur, I thought they were insulting me. I literally like, didn't know what it meant. I was about 30 (laughs) years, I was about 30 years old and we were, we had opened a number of places and we're going for more. And this guy just, yeah entrepreneur huh and i was like man why you got to call people names like what? yeah <laughs> why, why are you calling me some french name that yeah, right. probably means something terrible <laughs> i had no idea and it's funny you know that you know yeah kind of getting the name later on um another thing i had this discussion with somebody uh last week and it just pertained to people with creative backgrounds that get into entrepreneurship. It's almost just like an extension. Do you, do you, do you, have you yeah. noticed that? It's something that just kind of really occurred to me, but we were talking about like, why do we build these businesses? Why do we make these things? And this was a person that had studied mm-hmm. art. I was studied music and the goal was always to create, you know, I never wanted to be just like a, you know, somebody's, uh, I've studied drums and percussion. That was my instrument. I never just wanted to be somebody's yeah. drummer. I wanted to like create and make and build the whole thing. And it was funny as, as business started to fold in, because you, as you know, any successful musician knows you have to have business acumen to do it. Because yes. if you don't, if you don't have right. that and nothing happens. Yeah. Really happens. Yeah. That's something I've seen a lot is that um, many artists and creatives are entrepreneurs by default, right? right? Because there, there aren't as many just traditional jobs um, for the creative arts, uh, as maybe some other trades or technical skills. And so a lot of artists, um, end up being some, at least somewhat entrepreneurial, or they have a job and a side hustle and they sort of have to manage and balance that. But more and more, I think, um, so many of us, even in more traditional jobs have to think like an entrepreneur, at least in the sense of, I am the owner of my career trajectory and I have to make decisions and figure out when to take risks and when to try something new and when to make a change. Um, Because gone are the days that you just work for the same company for 40 years and then retire with a pension and they just take care of you. Um, We're all on a journey now of having to make moves and decisions and, and things like that. But I I think to, to your point, there's a lot of similarity between, creative artistry and creative business building, right? The, the, the being able to imagine what's possible and think outside the box and see things other people don't see and then bring it to reality. Um, you may not be painting with a canvas or sculpting something, but you're creating something that didn't exist and that other people look at and, and in some ways it seems like wizardry, right? Like, how did you do that? How did, and that's the way I look at artists because I'm not super artistic. So I look at, you know, great art and go, how in the world did, did that come out of you? So it's, it's, a very similar, uh, it's a very similar skill, I think, in just a different domain. Yeah. 
Very cool. All right, we're gonna take our last break. We're gonna come back and I wanna talk about uh, the book itself, distribution, how people can get, uh, you know, really like find yeah. it, all the platforms that it's on um, and, and just a little bit more about you and where people can find you. So please everybody stay with us one more time. We'll be right back. All right, folks, last set, let's make it our best here. We're talking with author Chris Kelso about his book, Overcoming the Imposter. Ah, I can't remember the tagline again. What is it? <laughs> Silence your inner critic and lead with confidence. Man, after the show, I'm going to nail it every time I say that's it. That's okay. Yeah, as long as you remember overcoming the imposter, that's the, that's the important part. It's the pressure. It's the pressure. Um, so you, you know, as we were just discussing, you get, you've got this book together. Now you have to, you have to market, you have to distribute. I mean, this is an entrepreneurial yeah. like endeavor in and of itself, right? It is. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm starting to think of the book like a business and, yeah. and, you know, you have to have a marketing plan. You have to know who your customer is. You have to know, uh, you know, why, what the value prop is, why should they care? Why do they want to engage with you? Um, and then you have to figure out those channels, those distribution mm -hmm. channels, you know, where are they going to find it? How are they going to hear about it? Uh, what great internet radio programs do you need to be on to, to reach the type of people that are going to be interested in what you have to offer? Um, and, I'm, and I'm also working on some um, extensions, you know, within the first week of release, the feedback was awesome. And one of the things that surprised me a little bit was I had people say, I read it once, I'm reading it a second time with a notepad and a highlighter and um, and I need a discussion guide. I need a study group. I need, I need more. Mm. Um, and so I have just started and uh, we're, we kicked off this week, a peer group um, model where I'm taking people through the book with a facilitated group coaching session where we're going to study the book together and learn from one another. And I'm developing an online course and some other pieces around it. So you're right, really thinking of it like a business and, and in the, you know, in the very sort of entrepreneurial mode as well, I, I went with a hybrid publisher so that I would retain the rights to the book and I put up the money to produce and print the book and, yep. you know, I own it um, because, you know, that's how an entrepreneur thinks, right? Yeah. I, want, <laughs> right. I want to own it. I want to control it. I want to have the, the biggest, I want to have my skin in the game and be able to reap the benefits if it does really well. So that's that's the approach that I took. It's very much my third business, if you will, third or yeah. fourth business. That's kind of how I imagined it would be. Um, could you can you uh, explain a little further, like hybrid publisher? How does how is that yeah. different from like standard publishing? Absolutely. So um, first of all, I'm not an expert on publishing. I've learned a ton about this in the last year, but. Here's what I've learned is traditional publishing, what you typically think of as like, you know, shopping your book proposal to a big publishing house. You're essentially selling your book to a publisher. They write you a check, um, but they're essentially buying the idea from you. Yeah. They're going to own it and you're going to get a royalty on what, how the book does, how well it sells. Um, the publisher puts up the cost of all the content production and editing and graphic design and, and then the print cost and then get it in stores and, and all of those things. The publisher does those things because they, they own it, right? It's, it's their asset. They invest in it and they reap the majority of the benefit from it when, if it does really well. Um, Self-publishing is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum, which is just you do it all. You do it yourself. And you have to go out and find the vendors and the resources and hire people to, to do all the, the, the putting it together. And let me tell you, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of skills to put a book together. I probably had a dozen people that were on the team that developed this from editing and graphic design and copy set, you know, typesetting and, and layout and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, so there was traditional publishing and then self-publishing. And now there's this, uh, this thing called hybrid publishing that's really grown in the last 10 years. And it's essentially a publishing company that manages all the work for you and does all the work for you. They, they project manage the whole thing. They have all the resources. They pull together the, the different pieces that need to be in place. And they source the printer and they can even warehouse uh, the books and do logistics and all that. But the author pays them as a service provider. So the author pays for all of those services and the author retains the rights to the book. So it's very much like outsourcing mm -hmm. you, like you would outsource anything else in your business. 
um, I essentially hired a publishing company to produce this book for me. Now they do get some uh, royalty off of it, but it's okay. instead of the sort of 80, 20 being in the publisher's favor, it's very much in my favor now where I get the bulk of the revenue from the book and they get a small piece for the work and effort that they put into it. Um, I'll give a shout out to my hybrid publisher, Dexterity Books. They are fantastic. Um, I've heard a lot of horror stories from authors about uh, producing a book and, and, and hating their publisher by the end of the process. And I can say that that is absolutely not the case for me. I love Dexterity. They've done a fantastic job um, and it was an awesome experience. That's great. Great. So it's basically like the inversion of traditional publishing. It is. Yeah. And if you, you know, if you're going to produce a book, um, I highly recommend hybrid publishing if you're not an expert on producing books, because it is a whole skill set and discipline that, you know, you would have to learn to self publish well. Um, but, uh, but know that, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have to put up some cash, you're going to have to fund this just like any other entrepreneurial venture on the back end, you get to reap the rewards. And it, it, it makes sense, right? As an entrepreneur, when you, when you have a business idea, but you don't have the cash, you go pitch investors. Well, you're essentially selling your business to those investors, or at least a big stake in your business to those investors. And then when things go well, they're going to get a big part of those rewards. And that's kind of the traditional publishing model. Um, the self-publishing model or, the, or this hybrid publishing model is more of the, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm going to put my own skin in the game and I'm going to use my cash to hire all the experts I need to build this business. And that's exactly what uh, self-publishing does. And at the end of the day, I own the book. The book is mine. I own the intellectual property. I own the rights to it. Uh, and, and I like that a lot because I, th I think it's a pretty good book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like that, uh, that framework. I, I wasn't aware of that. I just yeah. assumed... You know, I knew there were like people that dealt with some distribution and everything, but I didn't realize it was kind yeah. of like a, a full kind of done for you service, but you, you retain the, the, yeah. The, and cool. those companies run the gamut, you know, you can hire out just pieces of the, right. the, the puzzle. Um, but Dexterity is a full service, uh, hybrid publisher and they did everything even to the point that, you know, my stacks and stacks and boxes of books I have are in their warehouse and they ship them, That's they good. get them to Amazon and Barnes and Noble. They deal with orders and all the logistics, which is great. Cause I don't have, you know, piles of books in my garage or something like that. It's funny. I was thinking about, uh, releasing albums when you were saying all this and when we yeah. we like tried to re self-release our our first album in like 2007 we, you know we did it we it was a disc back then it was still yes. compact disc and uh yeah we just we tried to do it all on our own and i think i still have like 400 of them laying around in like uh -huh. my yeah album. you end up with stacks and stacks and well, it was right when everything was starting to go digital too. So I was like trying to sell some to some of my friends that were a little bit younger than me. And they were like, what am I supposed to do with this? And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, I have an iPod. And I was like, well, put it in your disk drive on your computer. And they were, they were like, it doesn't have a disk drive. And I was like, what? What just happened? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that's so a much. transformation that happened really quickly, didn't it? We right. just went from to like CDs are not even a thing anymore. Yeah. I still, we still have an external drive just in case, but yeah. I, I was curious how that, how that's playing out with the book now, because a lot of people do audible books, people do digital yeah. books. So kind of yeah. what's your, what's your ratio? You don't have to tell me like sales and numbers, but. You no, know, it's, it, it is interesting because I, I assumed that physical books would be the minority and that digital right. books at least would be the majority. And, and then of course, audio books are becoming more and more popular. That is not the case. Um, the The shift to digital in the publishing world has sort of leveled off, okay. And the ratios have held steady for a while because people still like the tactile feel of a physical book, and and that's different than music because you know a CD is yes physical, but you still listen to it. It's still not uh, <laughs> you know a thing you you don't sit there and hold the CD while you enjoy the the music necessarily. I'm sure some people do. But, uh, but people still like the tactile feel of a physical book. So, um, you know, another thing when you self-publish or hybrid publish, you have a lot of choices in the quality mm -hmm. and the, you know, hardback versus softback and the glossy finish and everything. And I chose to produce a really nice kind of a high-end book. It's got a, a, a great cover with raised lettering and it, you know, feels like a really 
uh, high quality book. And I've had many people comment on how much they like, they physically like reading and holding the book. And again, that's not right for everybody. Some people would, would the, their audience or their content warrants going less expensive and making it as you know inexpensive as possible so you can get mass distribution and low barrier to entry. Uh, but that's not the route that I chose, yeah. but you, you have those kind of options. Um, and, you know, you, I'm, I'm assuming maybe you could clarify when you're, when you're selling like the book audibly and, and digitally, the, the, you know, take home is a little better than the physical book. No, it is not. No, it's not. Okay. It is not. And, and there's one single reason why that is the case. And that is Amazon. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Amazon owns the market yeah. for digital and audio, especially audio that, let me just tell you, the economics of audiobooks are terrible. Okay. Um, because Amazon with Audible controls the market so much that they set the prices. You don't get to set your price. They set the mm -hmm. price and they keep, I believe it's 70% of the revenue on an audiobook. Amazon keeps it. So for an author, an Amazon, uh, an audiobook is not really a moneymaker uh, unless you're going to sell you know, hundreds of thousands of those right. audiobooks, and, you know, and really make a, a, a lot of little incremental dollars on it. Um, so the physical book is actually still the best. Um, I, I would much rather sell physical books than anything else because I make, I make more money on those physical books and it's, it's, it's odd. You'd think it's the other way around, but yeah, but it's because it's because the market is so tightly controlled on the digital yeah. assets right now. Maybe that'll <laughs> change. I don't know. Right. That's funny because I just assumed it would be it would be better. It's almost just like marketing then, right? When people are buying the audible book. Like yeah. What you're left with at yeah, the end of it. It it really is. And I, I actually don't have an audible book yet. Um that's on the roadmap. We'll probably do an audio book at some point. Um there's a whole separate production process involved in producing a quality audio book. Yeah. And uh that's uh that's something I'll do a little bit down the road. And there's actually some some reasoning and psychology behind why you hold off and release that later and that kind of thing. But I've had several people ask me for the audiobook, and I'm looking forward to being able to, to get that done a little bit down the road. Very cool. And then just before we go, if people uh, want to learn, well, where can they find the book? And if they want to, uh, you know, reach out to you, yeah. ask you questions, learn more about you, where are the best places for them to go? The easiest way to find the book is overcoming the imposter.com, just the title of the book.com. Um, and you can find the book there. You can find all the different places you can buy it. I mean, it, it's in physical bookstores and Barnes and Noble and places like that. It's in, it's of course on Amazon and, um, and even independent bookstores can, can order it if they don't have it in stock. Um, but you can order it direct from overcoming the imposter.com. You can find out a little bit more about me there and some of the work that I do. You can also find me at chriskelso.com. And as long as you remember that my name starts with a K, K R I S. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find online uh, on that website or on social media, um, LinkedIn, especially I'm, I'm pretty active. Okay. And then I'm on Facebook and Twitter and a little bit on Instagram and things like that. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, man. Really awesome conversation. I feel like every time I have a discussion surrounding this, I, another piece of it is revealed and that, that happened today too, where I'm like, okay, now I understand a little better. Cause people ask me all the yeah. time, especially I'm surrounded by a lot of people that are go-getters and they're like me they're like, nah, I don't, I'm confident. I don't have that. It's like funny the way it shows up though. Yeah. When you really dig in, you start to see, oh, okay. I see where it's not my big, big problem, but it's, right. it is affecting me in some yeah. little, but possibly critical ways. So thank yeah. you. I've enjoyed this, Jeremy. It's been great uh, being on the show with you and uh, it's been a fun conversation. Thanks. Likewise. All right. Well, you take care. The rest of you take care. We'll see you next week. Peace out.